Hi, good afternoon. It's um, Mark Gracie here. Um, I'll be running the, the webinar and uh, thank you very much for, for joining um, this webinar about uh, getting to know the GDPR. Um, it's uh, an overview of the General Data Protection Regulation and um, what uh, it, it introduces to the, the current data protection regime in, in the UK. Um, if you have any questions throughout the uh, webinar, in your control panel, there should be uh, the option to ask a question. And if you uh, type that in there, and I'll pick it up towards the end. Um, the presentation will last about 30 to 40 minutes, and then uh, we've got a, um, a bit of time then to, to answer any questions you might have. Um, but feel free, as I say, use the uh, question section in the control panel of the webinar um, software and uh, ask your questions, and I'll pick them up um, later on. Um, after um, after the presentation. So um, very briefly, just to introduce myself, um, I run a consultancy called Flavify Digital um, and um, I provide services to businesses around data compliance, um, data protection being one of the key things that uh, lots of people are talking to me about at the moment, not least of all because of the uh, general data protection regulation. Um, and I also run a service called the Digital Compliance Hub, which is an online subscription-based service, um, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, a bit later um, on uh, in the presentation. Um, my background's actually, um, uh, up until 2014, I had a 15-year career in internet and telecoms regulation, um, so I, I very much understand regulation, regulatory control, uh, and, and legislation, um, and in fact, um, an, an element of that time um, was working as a data protection officer when the Data Protection Act um, came into play in uh, the uh, in 1998. Um, so I'm fully versed in data protection regulation and um, what comes with it in terms of uh, dealing with day-to-day -day business management of, of data protection. So what we're going to talk about um, this afternoon over the next, as I say, 30-40 minutes is um, about the general data protection regulation and, and hopefully it will give you an insight into what that actually means and what that means in terms of the changes it's implementing in the UK. Um, hopefully um, a little bit thought provoking in terms of <laughs> making you think about whether it's something you need to worry about um, and if it is um, some thoughts and uh, sort of some practical steps you might want to take um, to help you uh, head in the right direction for, in terms of compliance. Before we start, um, I think it's worth just to setting out a few key definitions. Um, otherwise, I have a habit of using phrases like personal data and data controller without actually defining what they mean. So um, these are probably the key ones that it's worth um, understanding. Uh, they're defined in the Data Protection Act. And uh, as we're talking about the GDPR, they're, they're specifically defined in one of the articles in the General Data Protection Regulation as well. Um, personal data. That's data relating to living individuals. So the, the rules around data protection relate to um, personal data. It doesn't relate to business data, although there are sometimes uh, uh, an overlap because certain types of business data can be considered personal data. Um, for example, uh, sole traders data is considered personal data and not business data. Um, and uh, personal information um, relating to an employee within a business is also personal data. So employees have uh, um, rights under data protection. Um, and uh, if you are, for example, considering marketing to businesses and you work in the B2B environment, then uh, individuals' email addresses, um, as an example, would be considered personal data. So rules apply um, actually more around the privacy regulations and data protection about what you can and can't do with regards to marketing to uh, businesses. But in a general sense, data protection is about personal data. So that's data relating to a living individual, not a, a corporate entity or a legal entity as the uh, regulation refers to them. Uh, data processing, that's um, the term that's used in the, in the regulation to mean anything you, you do with that data and that, that covers everything from the, the full um, process of, of managing data. So that's the collection, that's the storage, that's the um, using it for the purpose which it was originally collected, it's the processing for the delivery of a service, it's the processing for marketing and, and so on. So processing as a term as a definition within regulation is actually about um, data and its use um, by a, a, an individual um, organization. Um, so when I talk about processing, I'm not just talking about using that data for a specific purpose. That covers the whole realm of, of, of data protection um, and uh, this, including the storage um, and, the, and the collection. 
Um, a data subject, that's the person whose data it is that the organization's got. Um, so uh, an individual, they would be referred to in the, in the legislation as data subject. Data controller, that's the organization that's collected or is processing that data. Um, and the data processor is um, sometimes a data controller as well, but a data processor is the organization that is processing the data for a specific purpose. So a good example there is if you have a data controller who's collecting the loads of email addresses for email marketing, they might pass those emails to a, an external third party for the purposes of processing for, for marketing, maybe to do some inbound marketing campaigns. Um, that third party would be the data processor. Um, and as you'll see when we talk about the GDPR, that is actually key to understand data processors because there is new um, uh, bits in the, in the regulation which put um, responsibility on the data processor as well as the controller, which hasn't existed in the past. So um, you might want to have a look and see, well, are we a data processor as well as a controller um, instead of being a controller um, where you may not have had to think about data protection in the past. So data subjects, the person whose data it is about, data controller is the organization that's um, processing that data and the data processor is um, a, a party that is doing something specifically with that data maybe an external um, party or might actually be the data controller. So I hope that's uh, just, just cleared that up. Um, in terms of what we mean about data protection, as I say, it's about data relating to living individuals, but the data protection has uh, in regulation and GDPR is no different, has essentially eight principles um, which range from the, the, the use of the data in terms of it being lawful and, and fair and transparent uh, about what you're going to do with it and that you're only using it for the purpose of which you um, originally collected it, that it's still relevant, so the data that you've collected is only relevant for the purpose that you need, you don't collect data that you don't really need, that is kept up to date and, and accurate, and you do something about it if you get told that it's, um, the data's changed, um, that you, uh, about the retention, so that's how long you keep the data, so typically you don't keep the data any longer than you have an, a, a purpose to do so. Um, there are individuals' rights, so individuals, that's the data subjects, have rights to access to um, uh, uh, relating to the use of their data and, and they range, there's quite a few individual rights, um, they, the most commonly known one is the data subject has request which is a right that the data subject has to ask an organisation what data do you have on me and how do you process it and, and, and to ask for a copy of it. Um, and then the, the last two, um, there's a, 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 a principle around security, so if you have data and you process data then you must do so in a secure manner. And also, if you process data outside of the European Union, of which we're still part of the European Union, um, then there's rules around how you go about doing that, um, because you need to ensure that the organisation um, is operating in an environment where they have adequate data protection in place. So there's, there's essentially eight data protection principles um, in the GDPR. They're, they're set out throughout the, the regulation. So that's when, when we talk about data protection, as I said, it's about living individuals and it's essentially around the processing of that data within those uh, essentially eight principles of, of how you may manage and store and process your data. So moving along then to the general data protection regulation, this is a, an EU regulation. Um, the uh, important word in that sta statement is it's a regulation, not a directive. Regulations mean that they apply to the whole of Europe. Um, so all member states' laws will be replaced by this regulation um, and um, it applies to everybody, um, all member states within in Europe, where a directive is um, the, the member states have some flexibility around how they implement it, but they have to implement it as a separate uh, piece of legislation. And there's a, slightly complication, a slight complication in all this because we're having a data protection bill, but I'll talk about that a, a bit later on. Um, but essentially, it's a European regulation, and if anybody says to you, don't worry about it because we're leaving Europe, uh, ignore that. That's wrong. Um, it's not too difficult to work out. This is coming in next year. Brexit, if it happens it, on the schedule, will be the year after. And then there's a, a lot of questions around actually making sure if we're not part of Europe, how do we deal with European data transfers and the fact that we have some legislation around data protection in place right now at the point of Brexit is going to exist after Brexit as well. So if anybody's telling you to not worry about the general data protection regulation because of the of Brexit, then um, they're wrong. Um, this is um, probably here to stay in UK law 
regardless of our status within Europe. Um, and uh, as I say, this is coming into play on the 25th of May 2018, and we won't be leaving Europe until a year after. So um, as a Europe, as part of Europe, we're going to be dealing with this um, as a European member state for probably about a year. So the, the fan on, on the slide right now um, is a, um, a representation of essentially the 10 key changes that the GDPR introduces into data protection um, law. Obviously, data protection is, is, is very complex um, in terms of what it allows you to, to do, and, there, and there's certain bits and pieces that can be interpreted in different ways, and there's lots of guidance out there around existing data protection law, um, particularly from the Information Commissioner's Office, who's, who's the UK's regulator. Um, but I'm going to focus on these 10 key things, and I'm going to go through each one in turn. Um, some of them will be quite quick, and, and some others, like consent, um, I'll uh, linger a, a little bit longer because they're a, a little bit more um, complicated and, and um, significant. So first up, scope. Um, as I said, this is European regulation, so it covers um, all member states across Europe. Um, what this means for the UK is that um, any aspects of the Data Protection Act which aren't um, compatible with the regulation get replaced. Um, essentially, the GDPR replaces the Data Protection Act. Um, but there's a couple of other additional things that's worth considering within scope. Um, under some circumstances, even if you're outside the EU and if you're processing the EU citizens' data, um, you will have to comply with the GDPR. Um, and as I've already sort of alluded to, um, data processes are now in scope in terms of um, responsibility. In, uh, under the previous directive, which, it, which implemented in the UK as Data Protection Act, um, processes had no responsibilities. It was all down to the data controller. Um, so if a data processor got it wrong, it would be the data controller that got into trouble. That's all changing under the, the regulation. Um, processes have um, a, a certain duties and, and, and will need to provide um, certain um, assurances, particularly to their controllers, about the fact that they're processing and managing data on behalf of the controller um, to enable the controller to maintain um, their uh, responsibilities. Um, so the biggest thing I'm certainly seeing are um, organisations who have become processors, and a good example of that are organisations like cloud service providers, um, if they're running software in, in the cloud, um, they are now a processor because they're allowing their clients to um, use their service for, for processing data and therefore they become a processor and there's certain responsibilities that they will now need to pay attention to. So as I said earlier, if you thought that you weren't within it because you've always been a processor in, and it's not your data that you're, you're collecting and processing, then um, you might need to rethink your responsibilities um, and the biggest thing that you'll probably see is a lot of your clients will be getting in touch with you and saying you're now a process so I need you to confirm that um, all of these things are happening and you can facilitate um, my own compliance. So, um, so data controllers are will need to carry out due diligence on their, on their processes in a much more uh, wider way than they've ever done before. Um, very quickly a thing on definition. A definition um, in terms of uh, data, uh, personal data, as I said, is in data relating to individuals, and, and the GDPR extends the scope of that slightly to introduce um, various online identifiers as um, as uh, personal data as well. So, if you were in any doubt about whether an IP address, for example, was an, um, a piece of personal data under GDPR, without any doubt, it is. As are other kind of online IDs and and handles um, as well. So, the definition. Um, has been extended to, to reach out to the, the digital world that we now live in um, and they foresee that we'll continue to live in um, in the foreseeable future. Um, and in fact, that's what the GDPR is all about. It's about bringing the regulation up to date with the digital era that we're currently living in. A, a quick mention of children. Um, consent to the next slide, but um, in terms of children, there's actually some specific regulations uh, um, articles in the regulation about children's data. If you run a, a service which may be of interest to a child and you are asking for consent for the um, purposes of processing their data, then there's a few things you need to do. First, you need to provide the messaging in a way that a child would understand, which I think generally is probably not a bad idea for adults either, um, but it needs to be a, a child-friendly messaging. Um, you will need to seek consent from a uh, person in uh, parental responsibility, so a, a guardian or a, a parent, and um, that you, you, they're happy for you to process their child's um, 
of the child's uh, data, which in turn implies that um, we may see um, some interesting uh, approaches to age verification. Now, a child under the regulation is defined as a uh, anybody under the age of 16, but um, the regulation allows member states to actually define that themselves as long as they don't define a child any younger than 13. And in fact, um, there's a good chance that in the UK, a child will be defined as under 13. Um, so as I said, there's specific rules and regulations around processing children's data. The key things are child-friendly messaging and seeking guardian consent. Now on the, on the point of consent, this is uh, the one that's got lots of people excited because um, if you rely on consent as the, the purpose for the, um, or the reason for processing data, and there are other reasons and, and purposes uh, that are legitimate um, purposes for, the, um, for processing. For example, you're allowed to collect data and use it for the purposes of delivering a, um, on a contract that somebody's entered into with you. Um, but if you rely on consent as the, as the reason and the purpose for processing the data, um, there's some very strict rules around, um, around that consent and, and the GDPR basically builds on what is in existence at the moment with data protection. Probably the biggest change will be those opt-in boxes that um, you have to untick to opt out of uh, marketing messages, for example. Um, but ultimately those six points there um, are the key to the changes. The messing, messaging needs to be um, very clear and transparent about who you are, what data you're collecting, what purpose you're collecting it for, um, and um, there needs to be an affirmative action to actually opt in for um, agreeing to the processing for that purpose. Um, what that means is if you're collecting data and using consent as your, your means for um, a, a lawful uh, uh, purpose for, for using the data, then you need to uh, make sure that you have opt-ins for all of the different purposes that you're going to be using and, and, it can't, and the wording can't be hidden in little terms and conditions or off in a privacy statement on your website. It has to be a very clear message and everything has to be a, an affirmative action um, for the consent. So what that does mean is we, we will see, as I mentioned, the, the end of the um, pre-ticked box saying untick this box if you don't want to be marketed to or the little asterisk that sends you off to a very small message that says we would like to market to you and we'll assume you're okay with that unless you um, uh, uh, tick this box. Um, that wouldn't be considered clear enough um, and therefore um, wouldn't be compliant. Um, there's also some other rules around uh, consent. So the, the consent shouldn't be a reason not to be able to provide a service. That's what consent without detriment is um, referring to. So if you need to collect data for the purposes of delivering a service, you can't say, um, you, you, um, sorry, that's a wrong, a bad example. If you're pr providing um, a particular function and you um, only allow that function to happen if you uh, collect data um, and have they have to consent to that data regardless, then, then that would become unlawful. Obviously, if you're collecting data for the purposes of delivering a service, then you, you have a right to, uh, to market to your customers relevant information. That's what's set out in the privacy regulations. Um, you have to be clear about your data and who you might be sharing it with. Um, you have to be upfront about the fact that the, the subject can um, withdraw their consent at any particular time and, and provide an easy way for them to do that. Um, and um, um, also, it's not on there, but there's a, also a requirement that you should be telling them how they can complain if, they, um, if they're not happy with, with your processing of their data. Um, and finally, um, you need to record um, the point at which you, you collected this consent so that you can um, provide evidence if required that um, consent was freely given and, uh, and an affirmative action was taken to, to give that consent. And in fact recording, um, there's a slide on it coming up, but um, recording is just, a, is just an example of actually what, what the buzzword is around GDPR at the moment, which is about accountability as a data processor or a, sorry, a data controller, you've got to be uh, accountable for what you're using the data for and it's down to you to prove it. So that's why if you're using consent as a, a valid purpose for um, processing of data, then um, you need to make sure you record the point of that consent. And, uh, and as I said, if somebody withdraws consent, then you need to make sure you pay attention to that, otherwise you'll be in breach. So um, some interesting challenges, particularly for marketers um, around consent. Um, I've heard things being said that this marks the end of email marketing um, marks the end of marketing in general because who would consent to marketing because nobody likes it and all those kind of things but actually I think it's more of an opportunity here to 
make sure that your messaging is something that people do want to subscribe to and if it is then they're going to consent anyway um, and uh, maybe not worry about it quite so much but it's a good opportunity to actually look at what you're doing and make sure you're delivering messages that people are interested in otherwise they aren't going to consent in the first place um, which is probably true anyway. Um, it also introduced some interesting challenges with regards to data you've collected already um, and if you have legacy data you're going to have to look at whether it complies with the rules that are introduced in the GDPR um, because if you if they don't then you're going to have to reseek consent um, and you may not be able to do that depending on um, um, it might not be able to do that for, say via email if it's any email addresses you've got um, depending on how you uh, collected the, the email addresses in the first place there's very specific rules about um, what you can and can't do um, in terms of uh, marketing already um, you just need to look at the Data Protection Act and the Privacy Electronic Communication Regulations and you'll need to bear that in mind if you are looking at your legacy data and how that um, is impacted by the changes um, and it also introduces um, uh, probably more due diligence checks if you're thinking of um, buying in data you will need to um, carry out diligence on the third parties you're getting the data from to make sure that they can prove to you that they collected the data lawfully that it was a positive opt-in to consent that um, you know if, if possible that they were clear that they were going to share that data with yourselves if, 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 if possible or um, um, at least understand their mechanisms which they've gone through and, and so that you can be sure that you won't be caught out by um, using that data and being seen to have done so unlawfully um, because the third party hasn't taken uh, proper due responsibility in terms of um, ensuring that you're, they, you're, they're selling the data that is GDPR compliant essentially. So three things to consider there. Going forward, what needs to change with regards to your consent mechanisms? What do you need to do with existing data that you've got and bringing that up to, uh, to the quality needed for GDPR? And thirdly, how are you going to manage buying in um, uh, data that you might want to use um, for the purposes of, say, marketing or something like that? So consent is a, a, is a real biggie here um, in terms of changes. Um, there's a couple of individual rights, as I mentioned. Individuals have rights under, under data protection legislation right now. Probably the most commonly known one is, is data subject tax requests, um, where people can request access to the data that you might store and process about them. Um, but the GDPR introduces um, a couple of new rights. The right to erasure, which is if you have no need to keep the data anymore um, because somebody has opted out of a mailing list, for example, then you have a, um, a requirement, not least of all, to make sure that you no longer keep it because it no longer has a, a purpose. But if you're specifically asked to make sure that you remove all data relating to an individual, then um, they now have a right to ask that. So that's the right to be forgotten, as it's commonly referred to. Um, this isn't a right so that enables an individual to say, delete all my billing information so that you can't charge me because that isn't, um, isn't, isn't sensible. That isn't uh, what this is about. This is about deleting data that you might have on hold for the time being, but there's no reason why you need to process it any further or, or the, the individual saying you don't need to um, process it any, bit, any further and I want you to delete all copies of it. Um, and the other right is the right to data portability. This, this gives the uh, individual the right to ask for you to export their data in a format which could be used in another system and they might be doing that for their own processing they might be sticking in an Excel spreadsheet or something um, but also um, it doesn't mean that uh, in a business environment you probably looking at some people asking you to export their data so they can import it into a competitor system um, which will help facilitate transferring of services between uh, competitors um, but uh, there's some guidance that have, has come out from Europe about um, what this actually means and you know at a, a basic level we can say well actually if we allow the data exported in CSV format then that should be standard for most people to be able to import but I suspect what we'll see is we'll see standards in, in industries or industry systems that um, set out a specific um, uh, format of data so that it can be easily um, exported from one system and imported into another. <clears throat> if you're processing large quantities of data then that also means you might need to look at some automated way to provide that otherwise you're going to be going down the route of um, uh, if lots of people are asking for this having to do a, a manual exercise rather than perhaps providing a function within a, a member's own portal um, their own access to, to their own data and how they can access that directly rather than having to ask you every time. So that's two new rights, the right to be forgotten and the right to have your data um, uh, 
exported in a format that is portable to, um, between systems. And um, moving along, um, as I said, accountability is a real buzzword of GDPR. It's all about you as a data controller and um, being able to be uh, show your accountability for what you're doing with with data subjects data, um, and that means you you have the responsibility to be able to demonstrate your compliance and. Uh, Apologies for the typo and not demonstration of compliance, but there should be demonstration of compliance. Um, so this is, uh, as I mentioned, with consent. You know, you you will need to record um, what it is that your your uh, the point at which you you got consent and um, and uh, having a record of that would be part of the ability to demonstrate your compliance from from consent. Um, and um, there's also, uh, under some circumstances, depending on what you're doing, particularly if you're processing data in an automated way in, uh, and lots of data as well, then you have other responsibilities around your processing activities. Uh, if you're a data processor, for example, and you're processing data on behalf of a, a data controller, then you will probably need to be able to record um, or provide documentary evidence of how your data is processed. And, and one of the, the requirements under the regulation is, is that the information commissioner could ask you to demonstrate the ways in which you process data on behalf of um, your clients, as if you're a data processor. So ultimately what this means is there are very specific regulations that uh, tell certain types of businesses that they have to carry out certain types of uh, recording. But um, I, I think from a, a data protection compliance point of view, if you can demonstrate that you've um, take these on board and that you have, you know, records of how people consented or how you collected that data and how you're using it, you're going to be in a better place than somebody who's just ignored it and thought that they won't need to worry about it because it'll never, you know, they'll never get caught out or anything like that. And that's the same with policies and procedures. If you get policies and procedures within your business, you can show that you're acting responsibly. Um, and that will um, sit better with um, the information commissioner than somebody who said, oh, I didn't realize I couldn't do that. And, and no, I haven't got a data protection policy to show that we thought about it. So um, from a, 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 a process and policy point of view, accountability is key. Um, where you can um, check, well, first of all, check whether you've got a legal requirement to actually record stuff. Um, and but where you can make sure you've got the policies and procedures in place and that you've got documentary evidence about how you are processing data um, and how you're coming about that data in the first place. So as I said, accountability is key. Um, there's the concept of data protection by design and default. Um, this, is, uh, this isn't really new to the UK because data protection uh, well, the Data Protection Act doesn't specifically refer to it, but the Information Commissioner has um, best practice in place by things like privacy by design and privacy impact assessments. But essentially what this means is the GDPR has now um, brought into the regulation um, the requirement that if you're building new systems and uh, that they will be processing uh, personal data, then you need to take on board any privacy and data protection ramifications of that service or that system. Um, and uh, certain processes and, and procedures and, and maybe products and services, you may need to carry out a data protection impact assessment, which is basically looking at this is the product and service, this is what we're doing with the data um, and assessing um, what that means for, um, for uh, the, the rights and the privacy of, of the data subjects who are, who, whose data is being used in that, in that system or service. Um, as I say, this isn't a, a new thing. Um, there's, there's bound to be some um, guidance coming from probably the uh, European um, regulators on this, but um, if you want to know a bit more about it, then it's worth looking at the data protection impact assessments and uh, the best practice that the uh, Information Commissioner recommends uh, under the Data Protection Act. But this is all about, as I say, making sure your services and systems are compliant with the privacy and data protection rights of, of the data subjects that uh, will be impacted by those, those systems or services. Um, DPOs, the data protection officers, these are people within uh, a business um, who look after the management of, of data protection compliance. Um, the regulation requires certain types of businesses and organisations. All public bodies have to have a data protection officer. Um, but other um, organizations, particularly if they process large quantities of data or certain types of data, will be required to have a data protection officer. And the regulation stipulates what that data protection officer should be responsible for and the role um, that they should have within a business. Um, and, and where they're coming from on this is that um, 
very often because data protection is a compliance matter, it's very seen, seen very often seen as a, a cost to the business rather than um, than something that's going to help get sales, and uh, and therefore um, data protection can sometimes be put to sort of the side when things are consider considered. And so the regulation talks about making sure that the data protection officer has a, uh, has um, the ear of the board and is allowed to get upon and do their job without being interfered with in terms of um, it being ignored or, or not being able to do their job. Um, that is a regulation that's specific to certain types of businesses and organisations. As I said, it's not everybody will have to have a data protection officer, um, but um, if you do need to have one, then there's specific rules about what you're supposed to allow the data protection officer to do and what the data protection officer is supposed to be doing. So it's worth looking into that. Um, if you think you're uh, affected. Um, some regulatory uh, environments, telecoms is a good example, already have requirements to report breaches to regulators and, and to the individuals, but um, um, the GDPR introduces that for, for everybody. So um, under certain circumstances, particularly if there is data that is leaked that um, could be harmful if it got out in the public domain um, to the data subjects, credit card details, for example, would be a good example of that, or or, or medical records, um, then you have a duty under the GDPR to not only report it probably to the regulatory body, but also probably to the data subjects so that they can take some action to make sure they mitigate any risk. Um, and there's a um, there's even a, a regulatory requirement within the regulation for data processes. If so, if you're processing data and you have a breach um, that affects data for a third party, you need to make, make sure that you tell the third party that the data has been breached so that they can consider whether they need to. Um, uh, do anything um, specifically whether they've got to report the breach as well. And of course that's essentially uh, confessing to the fact that you might have a problem with your system and then you might be investigated but there's a regulatory requirement to do that. And then finally the the, the sort of the the scaremongering stick that people a lot of people are, are talking about in fact the information commissioner has uh, posted a uh, a, a blog about this um, last week, I think it was, um, because they're, I think they're a bit fed up with people um, making up things about fines and what that's going to happen. But essentially, there's two levels of fines within the regulation. The uppermost level um, fines can be uh, up to 4% of global turnover or 20 million euros. Now, the way to think about this is actually just, just be a little bit pragmatic about it. Under the data protection rules right now, the information commissioner can fine up to 500k, so half a million. Um, the largest they've ever fined was 400k to uh, talk talk for their breach back in 2015, um, which was a, a quite a significant and serious breach. So if you look at that, the, the chances are, and this is the point the Information Commissioner has made in, in her uh, blog post um, last week, the chances are that um, you know they're going to act proportionately and that, 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 uh, that the regulation isn't about finding people and catching businesses out, it's about uh, making sure businesses are acting responsibly. But if it does go horribly wrong, then they have the powers to, to find up, up to potentially much larger impact um, values than, uh, than they have under, under current data protection law. So up to 4% of global turnover or 20 million euros, that doesn't mean that's what kind of size of fines we're going to be seeing, but there's potential that uh, they'll be much bigger than, than they are right now. Um, and if you're, if you're thinking about what that actually means in, in real terms and have a look at the Information Commissioner's website and then some of the actions that they've taken and you'll get a feel for what kind of uh, fines people are, are getting. So I've run through the General Data Protection Regulation in terms of the changes and what it implements in addition to existing data protection rules. Um, if you're thinking, uh, damn I need to start thinking about this and, and now is probably the time that you should be thinking about it. As, as I said, you've got, a, you've got until 25th of May 2018, um, so time is, is disappearing, but obviously you'll, you'll know your own business and, and what that means for your business as to what kind of jobs at hand. But um, on the screen now is a um, uh, essentially a five-step uh, approach to preparing yourself or your business for, for the general data protection regulation. The, the first step is, is about preparation, so that's about knowing the GDPR, so that's understanding essentially what data protection is about and what the GDPR means for your for your data in terms of what changes you might need to be doing. You need to convince your business that it needs to to pay attention to this because you're going to be impacted in it. So if you're a if you're a compliance manager or somebody who takes responsibility for data in, in your business then you, you may need to be talking to somebody at the board level to, to tell them to uh, uh, pay attention because you need to 
get stuff done in this in this area. Um, and getting stuff done will start with having a working group. You need people across the business who are going to be able to invest time um, and, and energy and be bought, you know, will buy into the concept of getting the business uh, GDPR compliant. So um, by setting up a working group, you've got a bunch of people who can be solely focused on on delivering that compliance. And, and the kind of people you're looking at is, you know, you, you might need somebody from the sales team because they process data, somebody from the marketing team because they do the marketing with, with data, somebody from uh, the support uh, team, the IT guys that look after systems your data are on, um, and somebody from HR to see how employee, employees records might be impacted um, and, and so on. Um, and uh, having a working group gives that focus within your business to, uh, to actually deliver the compliance. The next step is, is auditing, um, and that's basically looking at what data do we have, what systems is, are the, are those data, is that data stored on, um, and the policies that you have across your business relating to data protection. Um, if you put those in, a, in, in, in some kind of um, sensible order, you know, have some kind of register of, of, of essentially your data assets for data systems and policies, then you'll get a good understanding of what you've got right now, so that when you move on to the next stage, which is in the analysis stage, you can look at those three things and understand what is uh, what needs to be done with them going forward. So, a good example: if you if you collect, have data which you've collected purely for the purposes of marketing, then you've got to look at the consent models and whether that data is still relevant and and, and allowable, and how you're going to go about uh, ensuring that it's uh, cleaned or 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 you've resought um, the consent. Um, and you'll also understand what policies need to be updated and any system changes, which is why in your working group you need a full set of people involved across your business. The fourth stage is about delivery. So you've done, you've worked out what you've got, you've worked out what needs to change, you've then got to deliver and get that done. And, and as I say, you're aiming, your, uh, your target date is 25th of May 2018, but obviously you probably want to get that sorted beforehand. Um, and an element of that will be also making sure that your uh, company are fully briefed on, on data protection and, and the changes, so you'll need to carry out employee training. Um, and that might be employee training in a general sense, but also employee training that is bespoke to the individuals that uh, are responsible. So if you have particular teams like sales and support and marketing who, who, who are all invested in using data, they might need slightly different uh, pieces of training to uh, focus in on what, what their responsibilities are under the, under the new rules. And then the final stage, this isn't just about preparing your business for GDPR, actually, this is about ongoing compliance and management, and, and this is something that uh, if you're impacted by GDPR, then you should be doing anyway, because you'll, you'll be impacted by the Data Protection Act and, and, and the privacy rules that uh, control, particularly around marketing and things like that. Um, you need to manage your ongoing compliance, so you need to keep yourself up to date, make sure your, your, your data is, is still relevant, make sure that you're fully aware of any, any changes that are coming, um, and that your staff are, are regularly trained so that they understand um, from a refresher point of view that they mustn't forget about data protection and, and the importance it means for your business. And in fact, on that last point, managing compliance, I mean, there, there's, uh, it's a very cyclical process, you, you know, and this is the kind of role that a data protection manager, and certainly if you need one, a data protection officer is likely to, to be um, dealing with, these are dealing with the individual's rights and how you um, facilitate uh, everything from the data subject access request requests and, and data portability through to making sure your systems maintain security and are kept up to date from a security point of view. I've already talked about training, make sure your policies are reviewed regularly to ensure that they're still relevant um, and just a general review cycle of, of employee training, your policies and your approach and, and, and ongoing compliance. So um, I'm afraid if you're if you are touched by data protection re regulation in your business, then um, you know it isn't a box ticking exercise. It, it is all about um, getting yourself to the point of compliance and then maintaining that compliance and, and keeping on top of everything. But um, unfortunately, um, <laughs> the GDPR isn't just the only thing that's happening right now, um, and uh, there's a, a, a lot of uncertainty in some areas. Um, you may have heard, if you paid attention to the Queen's speech back in June, that there's a data protection bill. This is what the uh, Tories said they were going to introduce. Um, and uh, last week, maybe the week before, um, the uh, DCMS, uh, the government department, published um, its intentions for the data protection bill. Um, it's worth having a look at that. If you look at my site, uh, the web address is at the bottom of each of these slides, you'll, you, there's a, a sort of a summary um, on one of the blog posts about it. 
and very curious because they sort of set out some rules and regulations that they're going to introduce into the data protection bill for the UK um, and then they say and we're going to implement the general data protection regulation now there's no clear understanding whether that's an in intentional um, uh, indication that they're going to implement much stricter rules than the GDPR or that it's just that they they picked out the things that they like in the GDPR that they want to make sure become UK law. In essence the data protection bill will bring the GDPR into UK law and with regards to Brexit that is probably very important because at the point of Brexit all UK laws will become um, uh, UK law going forward post Brexit before they start looking at what they want to throw out and how they want to change things but um, definitely keep an eye on what's happening with the data protection bill we don't know the wording it's probably going to happen in a reading uh, in Parliament in September um, we'll have a better understanding there but uh, it might be worth having a, a look at the intention statement at, at the moment um, there's also some privacy regulations that are being reviewed the European uh, Parliament want to introduce these at the same time as the GDPR but they're still being debated so it's uh, questionable whether they're going to actually achieve that. This will be particularly relevant for marketers because it sets out the privacy directive, it sets out what um, we have uh, at the moment which is the privacy and electronic communication regulation rules and, and they set out uh, in conjunction with the um, data protection regulations and what you can and can't do in terms of marketing via email, fax, if you still do that, text messaging um, and uh, other rules around telephone marketing and, and, and the like. So not just the GDPR, data protection bill and e-privacy regulations. Um, jumping to the bottom of there we've got um, from some exciting times, well it depends whether you think it's exciting or not, um, Brexit happening in 2019 probably and what that might mean for data protection going forward. Um, post Brexit and, and where we sit as, a, um, as an outside the EU member. Remember what I said about European transfers when I was talking about some of the principles of data protection. How's that going to work with us not being part of the EU? Um, and, um, and also the enforcement actions because this is a new regulation, the GDPR I'm talking about here, um, there's a good chance that um, we're going to see uh, some sort of decisions made in certain areas of interpretation um, and so it's worth keeping an eye on that. And then the middle two um, hexagons there um, are about guidance. There's the Information Commissioner coming up with guidance and there's information that's um, coming from the Article 29 Working Party. Apologies, there's a cons um, consent in both of those. It, um, I'm talking generally about guidance but actually on the consent guidance point of view we were promised stuff from the ICO um, in the summer. It looks like we're probably not going to get that to the end of the year because they're waiting for the Article 29 Working Party's consent uh, guidance um, but there's quite a lot of guidance coming out from the ICO and the Article 29 Working Party those are the guys that are at a European level or the, or the regulators so there's a lot of consent to look out for as well. Um, I'm mindful of the time I've been uh, talking for a, a bit longer than uh, originally intended uh, so apologies for that but very briefly you've got to think about what you're going to do, how you're going to, um, whether you need some help um, and I, I've got a service called Digital Compliance Hub as I mentioned at the beginning which um, uh, provides, which is part information guidance and toolkits to help you with your compliance and GDPR is a strong focus of, of the hub right now um, and it's part, uh, you can think of it as a, a support retainer or, or helpline so if you've got specific questions you can book um, uh, telephone slots to uh, have a conversation about it and address those particular issues or you can uh, ping out uh, emails, it's a subscription based service but at the moment you can sign up for a free month if you want to try it out and see whether it's uh, what, what you need for your, for your business. Um, uh, whether or not it is, um, I can also offer um, consultancy services which range from uh, compliance audits to uh, ongoing management and, and consultancy and training and as I said digital compliance hub fits within my, in my consultancy business. Um, and I'm running a number of workshops and webinars over the coming months so if you, if you go to the digital compliance hub or the Flavor Fives website you'll see uh, there's an events section that's got uh, a, a range of different things that might help and if you're interested in marketing from a, from a marketing point of view there's one coming up in September that's specifically looking at GDPR privacy and, and consent. So that was, uh, while well, I catch my breath very quickly, um, that was all about the GDPR. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look to see whether I've got any questions. Um, now's the time to ping them across if, you, if you've got any questions and there's quite a few. Um, there. So if you just bear me a second, um, feel free to carry on and pinging them over and I'll, I'll just uh, run through what I've got. Uh, a good question from uh, Sarah or Sarah, um, how do you control verbal data sharing? Well, 
Unfortunately, you can't, um, but it's about uh, instilling in your staff that um, data protection applies and that um, sharing of data verbally or, or otherwise um, is, is a breach of the Data Protection Act, um, depending on who you're sharing it with, of course. Um, if, it, if you don't have a lawful um, reason for sharing it, then, then it's a breach, and you've got to put controls in. And that's why I, I would always say have policies in place that uh, uh, hard code that for the purposes of your business so your employees know what their responsibilities are, but roll out training, and that's training across the business in terms of very specific roles, um, but also training in a general sense. So that might be if you have a, an, an annual employee conference or an, uh, um, or an opportunity to deliver um, some, some training, get that message across at, at every opportunity and deliver specific training to, to departments who are particularly impacted in the processing of data. Um, and even you know, um, if you have a, a, an onboarding exercise for new employees, make sure data protection is part of that. Um, but you've got to control it. How do you control it? It's educating your staff and making sure that they realize that if they are found to have done something like this, then not only will your business get into trouble, um, they'll probably lose their job um, because it will be a you know, breach of employee contract or, or to or that effect. Uh, great question from Richard. Uh, if we store contact form submissions uh, from a client's website in a database that is hosted, are we the processor or is the hosting company the processor? Um, they will, uh, they, they being the, the ones who would have access to it. Well, you as, as the uh, company that is uh, providing the, the storage um, would need to carry out due diligence on the hosting company. Um, but in, in essence, in, in that scenario, um, the, the data controllers data that you have, that you're providing on, on their behalf, um, you would need to make sure that you um, comply with the rules as a, as a processor um, because you, you, you're not the controller unless you plan on doing something um, with that data as well. But um, it would be, you, you would be the processor because you would be the person that would be uh, facilitating the, the storage or the processing of the, of the data. Um, but the hosting company still has a role in, in all of that, but you are more likely to have a, um, a responsibility to ensure that you've taken responsibility um, than, um, um, than, than the actual hosting company. Uh, another great question, um, do you have to ask for consent every occasion that you need to use someone's data? No, you need to look at the, what are the lawful purposes for which you're um, allowed to process the data. Um, you don't need to ask consent at every opportunity, but um, there's um, certainly a lot of guidance on the Information Commissioner's website actually about circumstances which you have to seek consent, if consent is the, the, the lawful purpose that you're using the data for. Um, but uh, no, you don't need to ask consent at every uh, occasion, but you might need to review consent on a regular basis. Um, and there's a bit of mixed messaging about what that regular basis might mean, um, you know, whether it's sort of six monthly or, or, or annually. But again, it would be about having a process in place that you could demonstrate that you, you review that consent um, at, at an adequate time. But they certainly don't expect you to, to seek consent um, at, at every opportunity. Um, you just need to perhaps review it on a, on a regular basis. So from a marketing point of view, it's a good opportunity to perhaps review your data and make sure it's fresh and, and, and that the people who are on it are, are relevant and, and useful to have on it, on, on your list, that is. Okay, sorry, just reading a quick question. Right, okay, so a question from Joe about um, an Excel sheet full of journalists' names and contact details. Um, some of them work for big organizations, others are freelancers. Um, in terms of communicating with them, uh, what do you need? So, so two questions essentially. What, what's the, what's the situation with regards to the use of that data um, and uh, and also how do you go about protecting it? Well, if you've got people on that list, if, if they're business to business, then um, then you need to look at the privacy and electronic communication regulations about marketing to businesses, which basically say generic email addresses, you can market to your heart's consent, but provide an opt-out. 
um, to individuals within the organization that's personal data but you can market to them provided it's relevant to their business and it's sort of relevant to what they do in their role and again you have to provide an opt-out but if you've got people in who there who are freelancers or bloggers um, who are not businesses then that's personal data so data protection rules apply and you can't market to them unless um, you have consent or a lawful purpose for doing so so for example if you're providing a service um, so you'll need to be careful about how you go about communicating with them um, in terms of their data because data protection rules will, will apply. Um, in terms of security, yes, uh, again, same rules. If, if you've got personal data in, in that database, in that Excel spreadsheet, you're going to have to look at taking reasonable care in um, setting uh, security measures in place. So that might be, um, yes, password protecting as you suggest. Um, the spreadsheet, as well as making sure your, your laptop is, is uh, password protected, you can't just go straight into the laptop. That if you can get access to it because it's in the cloud on a Dropbox, that your, your phone's got adequate um, login credentials to make sure that somebody couldn't uh, steal your phone or pick your phone up off from a um, bus or train seat that you accidentally left it on. Um, these are all things that you would have to, to take uh, stepwise and, and also things that you would have to demonstrate that you've taken necessary um, uh, action to to ensure security and if you had a policy in place with regards to all of that and you could say well actually you know generally my security is secure you can't get into the data that database without a password you can't get access to the database without using my computer and you can't use the computer without a password and so on then you're you're likely to be okay so if somebody did manage to get through um, all of those things the information commissioner would take that into consideration I'm sure um, I think uh, Joe, you're in a in an interesting situation because of the fact that you've probably got a mix of business and 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 what would be considered non-business data, um, and how you use that. Of course, if they've given you their details because they want you to keep them up to date or or use them for for um, uh, potential blog posts or or news article articles, given that you're talking about journalists, then then you could say that you have a legitimate interest in the processing of the data for that purpose. Um, but uh, if you're if you're scraping emails off of um, off of uh, websites and things like that and doing general marketing to them to sort of sign up to your services for the PR purpose, then you need to to think about um, just making sure that you're compliant for, for that. Uh, well, there's quite a few questions. I'm not sure I'm going to get through all of them, so I just have a quick look at um, some others. The ones I didn't answer, I'll, I'll follow up with uh, separately. Um, So, good question from Alex. Do you ban people wanting access to data from personal devices, e.g. remote workers, um, uh, logging into a central data system? This is all about security and the principles around security of data. No, you don't have to outright ban them. You just need to make sure that you've got processes and uh, approaches in place that, um, that mitigate any risk of, of disclosure of the data. So. In, in, a, in a raw sense, if you're sticking data on an internal network um, and you allow external access to that data, you know, the questions to ask yourself, are you setting up uh, virtual private networks to allow access to that data? How do they get access to it? If it's in the cloud, is it password protected? Do you have two-factor authentication turned on so that um, it's uh, on an individual basis so that people can, uh, might even if they guess passwords, they need to have a, a device to hand to, to enter a further code to, to get access to it. Um, so no, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's banning um, access to data on a central system that remotely, it's about doing it right and, and making sure you've got the protocols and the processes in place, both technically and from a procedural point of view as well. Um, so you, you need to, to um, ban the uh, openness of it all, if it is indeed already open, um, and you need to put in place steps to to mitigate uh, risk of security breach by um, somebody being able to get access to that because somebody's left a phone on a bus, as I mentioned earlier when I was answering Joe's question. Um, it's, it's about putting steps in place to, to mitigate the risk. Um, but you also, depending on what they're doing with that data, you also need to make sure they understand that they can't, you know, um, uh, in a sort of a... Um, maybe a bizarre example but sitting on a train accessing the data with somebody looking over their shoulder if it's personal data and, and especially if it's sensitive data and then um, then you know you're breaching data protection so they need to understand 
what they can and can't access and in, in what scenarios and what situations. Um, and, uh, you know, if they're doing things like, well, they're accessing it at home, then they're printing it out and then they're leaving it on the back seat of their car until they get to the office to shred it, that kind of thing. Well, then there's, there's other ramifications around data um, and potential breaches for that as well. And, and, and that kind of behavior could be, um, would, would be frowned upon as, a, as a, an unlawful access. So thank you for all the questions. Apologies if I didn't answer your specific question, but I'll, I'll follow up separately on, on that. Um, it's uh, one o'clock, so um, I'd said I'd run for an hour and, and we've done that. So thank you very much for joining. I um, hope you found that useful and um, I'll uh, be in touch uh, with a copy of the um, uh, presentation um, and uh, uh, hopefully a recording if the recording worked um, uh, a bit later on today. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.